and let's jump in. Um, if you look on the app, we've uh, we've spent the last three weeks or two weeks leading up to today talking about uh, the Bible and gender roles in the scriptures and wrestling with them. What do they actually say? And then how are we going to apply this as a church? Um, and so a couple of things just by way of review. As we went through, we talked a lot about how to tackle tough texts, talk about um, historical contextual hermeneutics, making sure we do our best as Westerners separated by thousands of years to place ourselves into the cultural context and draw out the meaning that it was originally intended for. And that is incredibly difficult when it comes to passages that have really any level of ambiguity. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so we have to do it though. We have to wrestle with those two questions. What was the what did the author originally mean? And what did the original audience hear? Because the scriptures can't mean today for us what it did not mean for them back then. Okay. Um, and so we talked about that. Then last week we tackled a couple of the more challenging texts, the women be silent texts. Um, after going through the scriptures for the last year, some of the uh, main points by way of review, we believe that both genders are equally created in God's image. Amen? Amen. God created man and woman, and in his image, in their image, he created them, that both men and women equally reflect the image and glory of God. Okay? Um, we believe that both genders are equal participants in grace through Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, men and women are just as saved as they're, we're all equally saved. We all stand before the cross, both in need. And we all stand before the cross, experiencing grace together. Amen, church. Yeah. Amen. All right. We believe that both genders are invaluable, bringing unique strengths and perspectives to the functioning of the body of Christ. Amen. Okay. Thank you, John. <laughs> I'll read that again. We believe that both genders are invaluable, bringing unique strengths and perspectives to the functioning of the body of Christ. Okay? The body of Christ is not a man thing. The body of Christ is not a woman thing. Okay? We need everybody. Amen, church? Amen. We believe there's a clear, there are clear biblical examples of women praying and prophesying in the assembly of God's church. Okay, yeah. you go through 1 Corinthians, there's 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 14. There are clear examples. There are women who did these things, the prophetesses of uh, Philip's four daughters that prophesied. There, there are clear examples of women who prayed and prophesied in the public assembly in the scriptures. Um as we went through and, and really tried to grapple with a historical contextual hermeneutic, we saw that the word translated man slash woman can be equally translated husband slash wife. And in some of the contexts of these passages, it makes more sense that it's talking about a husband and a wife than it does a man or man and woman. Make sense? And we went through all those last week. If you have any questions about that, both the notes and the, uh, the video of the lesson are on our website. You'll see at the bottom, there's a, a Bible and gender tab. We'll keep that up that uh, keep that up there. It will become a part of kind of the who we are as a church. Sound good? All right. Um, lastly, we believe that while there were women speaking in the assembly, that 1 Timothy 2 put some level of restriction on that speaking, and that's what we're grappling with. Okay, so those are a couple of things that we talked about. Any others, any questions about anything that we've talked about in leading into our uh, announcement tonight of what we're going to do with it as a church? For a leadership group, am I leaving anything out? Is there anything else that's important or no? Doing great, Rich. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> So now, if you want to look in the app, there's a uh, title. There's a thing that says KBC Gender Role Implementation. Is that what it says? Okay. Gender Role Implementation on the app. I also printed a couple copies in case people don't have apps or that kind of thing. There's a couple copies here. Anybody else need one? <laughs> I'm not saying I predicted it. I'm just saying it's a, yep. it's a real possibility. You want one? There you go. 
All right, so we penned this because it is such an area of confusion and um, potential challenges that we want to make sure we're very clear and articulate about how we communicate our implementation plan. You with me? So if you want to read along, let's read together. It says, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I'm convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person, it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you're no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy someone for whom Christ has died. Romans chapter 14, verse 1, 3 and 4, and 13 through 15. KBC family, as a church family, there are always areas where we will see the Bible differently. Aside from the core teachings of our faith, faith as summarized in Ephesians 4, 3 through 6, we must strive with all God's power to maintain unity through these disputable matters. The Bible and gender is one of these areas where well-studied, God-loving people see the teachings of Scripture in very different ways. Over the last year, we have taken the time to study these topics at length, both corporately and as a leadership, and we feel ready to move forward with implementation of gender roles in the KBC. One clear teaching of the Bible is headship in marriage and church leadership. I do want to clarify, that is explicit in marriage. It is implicit in leadership. What I mean by that is it is explicitly talked about husbands and wives. Husbands are the head of the wife. Wife, you know what I mean? Uh, it is implicit in church leadership in that none of the authoritative positions are held by women in the scriptures. There were no women apostles. There were no women evangelists. And there were no women elders. Okay? So those are the positions that hold ecclesiastical authority. And none of those positions were held by women in the scriptures. Okay? so. That's what that means. I wanted to clarify that one is explicit and one is implicit. To this end, we will only have men serve as elders and evangelists. We'll continue to foster women's ministry leaders to do the work of the ministry among the women. And when the time comes, we'll also have elders' wives serve as well. Ultimately, guided by diverse, cooperative input, ecclesiastical authority of the church will be with the elders and the evangelists. Deacons or servants of the church will be both men and women. This means either gender may serve in organizing need meeting ministries in the church, i.e. hope, kingdom kids, worship, ushering, etc. Sunday assemblies are the area where there are the most conscience issues. This is where the survey was very helpful. It was not a vote, but a way to gauge the corporate conscience to inform our decision as a leadership. Some people see complete freedom for women, like Philip's four prophetess daughters, under the headship of church leadership. Others take the English translation of women, women remaining silent text to include all women, not just wives or rebellious sectors, and command complete silence, not just respect or deference. Therefore, with the goal of love firmly in our sights, we will be cautious in our implementation while working extremely hard to ensure that the women's voice is heard while not hurting people's conscience. To that end, here is our implementation. That's a very verbose way of saying we're going to do our best to apply Romans 14. There are people for whom this is a conscience issue. And we don't want to hurt them because God loves them. But there's also people who feel that there's freedom here. 
and we want them to feel the freedom to employ those gifts. It's sticky waters when we're all together and we're going to do our best. Amen? Amen. To that end, here's our implementation. Women will be able to share welcomes. Women will be able to share thoughts at communion, but a brother will pray for communion. Communion is a particular area where people have conscience issues. They, because it is one of the, the few clearly mandated, um, what do they call them? Not sacraments, but uh, ordinances of Jesus for us to practice. They feel like that is an area that should be under headship. And so while we're, we're going to allow women to share thoughts at communion, we're going to have a man pray for communion. Okay. Um, women will be able to share a response to a sermon. Women will be able to pray. Women can share personal testimony, women's perspective or area of expertise as a part of a Sunday sermon. Women can read scripture for the church and women will be able to lead songs or a song. Restrictions. Women will not be able to preach Sunday sermons alone as they carry authority before a mixed audience. Again, these steps are both to give platform for women's voices while protecting the conscience of the whole family. Along with these steps, we will intentionally provide opportunities for women teaching other women, both publicly and privately, in adherence to Titus 2, 3, and following. Lastly, women will be able to teach on areas of expertise, but these will be separate times where people whose consciences are bothered will have another option or need not participate. Again, these are not easy questions to answer, but the clear biblical call for all of us, wherever we fall on the spectrum of conviction in this area, as Jesus' followers, is to follow him to the cross where he surrendered all of his rights and preferences for love. If we do this, God will be pleased. If you have questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to talk to any of the leadership group, Godspeed, the KBC leadership group. And that has the list there. Sound good? Yep. Yes. Only two years in the coming. How do you I feel great? This is awesome. Yeah. Finally, this is off my plate. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so that is that is after praying, after studying, after wrestling with scriptures, wrestling with the the, the conscience of the church and getting feedback from people. Um, this is what we feel like is the best uh, course forward in implementing um, gender roles in the church. Sound good? Questions? Yes, Rich, I have a question. By the way. Uh, can you explain the difference between preaching and teaching? Okay. So um, teaching is informing people. Authoritative preaching, if you look in First Timothy, uh, there are a couple of different situations gave my Bible away. First Timothy chapter one, Timothy is commanded to silence false teachers. Later on in first Timothy, um, <clears throat> I believe three. Come on up. See, this is how, this is how open we are to Jim. Nobody thought that was good, huh? Okay. <laughs> Um, so if you go throughout the book of first Timothy, there are several passages where, uh, he is commanded to authoritatively command things like, uh, for first Timothy four eleven, command and teach these things on down. It says, command those who are rich in the world. Verse 18 command, uh, this is chapter six. Yeah. Command them to do good. There's, there are things that are, um, given to an evangelist to command. Does that make sense? I.e., if there's false teaching, I, as the evangelist, have the responsibility to silence false teaching. That is not a, I'm not teaching that person. I am commanding them. You're not doing that here. Does that make sense? So authoritative preaching has to do with uh, those kind of things, commanding people to do things, as well as direction, overall direction of the church. Okay. And so that is what we understand this passage to be taught or these, the, the idea of Paul not allowing uh, a woman to teach and preach and have authority over a man. The idea is 
in those situations, you are exercising authority when you do those things. This is the reason why we're not going to have women preach on Sundays, because there's an element of let's go. You know what I mean? We've all seen it. I get feisty, that kind of stuff, right? And and things that have to be addressed in the church. We believe what Paul is communicating there is that is the role of, of men to do in the church, not women. Make sense? Women can do it to one another. Okay. But in those specific instances, um, we believe First Timothy, the context of First Timothy is those kind of commands and teaching. Make sense? Is that? Yes, that does answer the question. Any, uh, any other leadership group have thoughts about that? No? All right. Anybody else? Other questions? Lacey has a question. So just like, I know we had kind of talked about like, <clears throat> what is the, like, does that same principle apply? Like say like, a, I guess the authority and headship. I think we talked about that like earlier months ago, but like that's for husband and wife. What about non-husband, non-wife, girl and guy talking? There, there's no headship there. Okay. I mean, both people should be very respectful of the other person, regardless of the gender. Like, there's there's a lot of clear commands about that. But that's, that's I guess I should have said this. Sorry, guys. There have been misuses of these verses. Mm -hmm. And I would say that's one where a woman automatically has to submit to a man just because one's a woman, one's a man. That's not scriptural headship is in marriage not uh overall i would also like to say um i know that there are women who have felt disheartened or hurt or discouraged by the application of god's word in our church and for that i completely apologize take 100 percent responsibility i believe what we're doing and wrestling with these texts is right and good and so if that has been the case, we did so in faith and love and ignorance and apologize. So, so anyway, yes, no, the headship is not just between all men and all women. It's clearly husband and wife. Outside of that, we submit to one another lo love for Christ. And in that, we submit to, in headship, we submit to one another <laughs> reverence for Christ. That's everybody. Is that helpful? Any leadership group, any thoughts that you would add or take away from that? Just kidding. Don't take away any of them. <laughs> Good night, man. This makes sense. Uh, uh, Pro has a question. Sure. Um, in the dynamic of a married woman and a married man, not married to each other what is that dynamic do you address your husband to talk to the man if there's concern can you directly go to that person like how does that relationship work john you have thoughts <laughs> <Come on up. laughs> Like, does the wife talk to the wife to talk to her husband? Like, I don't know. Can you be more, you have to be specific to the situation. So in, in a general, such in a general sense, I would never disciple someone else's wife. And I, I shouldn't expect that back to me, um, unless it was an immediate, like, caught in sin, stop doing that, you're affecting someone else situation, which I think goes for anybody can disciple anyone like if you're hurt in the body or hurting or like sitting in a way that affects people mm -hmm. anyone can stop that but uh, as far as like you know you have to be more specific on like, I'm, i do have a specific um example so it's kind of helpful <laughs> if okay say i see a man 
a father speak to his child in a way that I think is straight up, it's not right, it's sinful. How would I address that with the man? Because I think that it does need to be addressed. Do I talk to the wife? And then she addresses it with her husband or would I share it with my husband? He shares it with the father or could I go directly to the father? I've had this question for a long time. (laughs) (laughs) All of a sudden, John. (laughs) I'm glad I don't have kids. So, what, what I what I would say. So what we we brought in the big guns. John will answer, and then we brought in the big guns. I would say, no, no, give, let John answer. Okay. I would say it it really does depend on like if it's just like a oh he's really coming off too strong on his kids or something like that. Um, it could be a like um like any of the sisters here could say here, here's a better way that John you could talk to your kids and here here's why and i wouldn't feel like attacked or disrespected by that but uh for um anyone even like especially if they don't even know me like if a brother who i don't know comes up to me like hey you're really messing up your kids i'd be like who are you but like if if they came with scripture i'd be a little bit more receptive but i think uh, maybe going through um either the husband's discipler or going through your husband to talk to the to the brother at fault. That's my general answer. So but here here comes the big guns. There no, no, I'm there not the big gun. Come on over here so they can see you. <laughs> but, uh, uh, no, I I think John's right, but I, I think the example that was brought up had to do with couples and couples. And that's why we love to do coupling, discipling with each other when folks are married. And that's why we get counsel, you know, in that way as well. So this is very easy to take care of. If you see something, then go talk to your husband, set up a time with that other couple. And the four of you spend time together working on things and make it a very positive thing. Make it a teaching thing. And, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of sounds like that in this case, uh, you know, there's a potential for that uh, being the case that you might be wrong. And so that's why it's important for the couples to get together and talk about that. Because let me say this, that I've been around a long time and, uh, you know, I've seen many, many different ways in which uh, parents raise their kids and uh, in, in most cases, they've turned out incredibly well, even with different styles of uh, raising those kids. So, yeah. so but bottom line, you're, you're talking couples and couples. And so that's why we have couples get together and really spend time together, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. talking through these things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Randy. All those things are right and wise. The, the goal of it is doing it in love. Is it sin if the woman goes and says, hey, Bob, I saw you interact with your kids and it seemed to come across kind of harsh. Would you be open to talking about that with me and my husband or whatever? That, I don't think that's necessarily sin. That's not, in my opinion, that is not usurping authority. That is not trying to attack headship. Does that make sense? Yes. Is that the best way to handle the situation? I think these guys probably have better ways that everything they've said. But at the bottom line, if you're looking for is it sin or not for a woman to correct a man, I don't see that biblically. You know what I mean? I, some of the best discipling I've ever gotten has been from women. Or well, that's an exaggeration. You know what I mean? That's preacher speak. But really good discipling has come from women who didn't. I didn't feel any like oh, big this. You know what I mean? Like this is. Right. <laughs> this is about love, you know? And so I think as long as it's guided by love, that's that's the goal. It's what's the wisest, most loving way to handle this situation? What they said is. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. Was it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nick wants Nick wants Nick wants to know who it was. He's, he's gunning. 
<laughs> Any other thoughts? What, what do you guys think about this? What are your honest feelings and thoughts about it? Hey, Roy. Oh, I think it's great. Um, it's such a delicate topic um, that people like battle over. And I have I have friends who are my brothers in Jesus in different congregations who are battling with these topics as well. Um, and I don't know exactly how they're supposed to go about it, but I really appreciate and respect how we have done it carefully and thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. Discussion. I've never even been outside having yeah. a discussion of ways back. We have a lot to talk about it. Um, so it makes me feel I, I, I like being here. I appreciate how we did it. It's awesome. I appreciate that. Kara. No, as as a woman, I feel mm. very respected by the whole process. I remember as a kid, like when we read the verse about like women can't preach in church, and Mia and I were like, Oh, what is this crap? <laughs> 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 this. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I genuinely feel like really good about how it was carried out and all of the things that like we can do. So you guys can feel it very respectfully, um, with love, with, like with towards everyone's opinions, which is hard. So you guys killed it. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate that feedback. Any other thoughts? There we go. We Ash know Ashley has a question. Go ahead, Ashley. So then, so like, would churches that are led by women be the problem? Like, there are churches where it's a head pastor that's a female, or it's multiple females that are the sure. Sure. <laughs> so that's a, that's a great. I appreciate you asking that, Ashley. That's a great question. So this is the, what defines this as a disputable matter. I mean, it, it, it's something that this is not a core teaching. In other words, what people believe about this is not necessarily going to determine their eternal salvation. There are things that what we think about it will eternal will affect our salvation. Okay. If someone doesn't believe Jesus is the son of God, I'm sorry. They ain't making it to heaven. That's kind of like, that's a core thing. Okay. This would fall outside of that. And this is, there's three, we talked about three tiers of doctrine. There's core, there's important, and then there's peripheral doctrines, okay? This, I, I don't know for sure, but it seems like it falls under the important one, but not a core one. And so if there's a church that practices uh, a woman being a pastor, I don't agree with it, but I can't say that they're not going to heaven necessarily because a woman is a pastor. Does that make sense? I don't think it's the best. I think it's important. There are biblical principles in there that are being overlooked that will have consequences because God just doesn't arbitrarily say stuff like we talked about on, on Sunday. Oh, I ran out of breath there. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't necessarily mean there's not salvation there. You with me? Yeah. 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 Does that so, answer your question, Ashley? So is it mostly in title or is it in action? Because there are people who are married and the first lady is also a pastor, but she doesn't necessarily. Yeah. No, that's a great question. I appreciate that. So biblically, the way I see the biblical positions, pastor is the same as elder. It's uh, a synonym in scriptures. There's three, three words, Randy, overseer, elder, and pastor that are all used um, interchangeably to describe the biblical office of eldership, okay? That in Christian culture, modern Christian culture, anybody who's a leader is a pastor. That's just kind of what they do. I don't agree with that biblically. Not anybody who is a leader is a pastor. There are a lot of requirements biblically for people who are going to fill the position biblically of an elder, and a lot of these people don't meet those requirements. And so um, what is used culturally where people say pastor is different than what we're talking about elder. And so I, I, I don't know exactly in the Christian culture, you know, with everybody's called it, called a pastor. I, I don't exactly know. But biblically, there are no women pastors, i.e. elders at all. Did I answer that question? Did I answer the question? I feel like I pushed yeah. it. Yeah. I feel like you did. Did I? 
Yeah. Say it, yep. say it loud. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> say, say it louder. <laughs> Jacob, Jacob, my face. <laughs> Jacob has a question. Go ahead, Jim. Hi. Uh, I was just, just for clarity, but um, everything that you just said, um, as far as like disputable matters, um, you, however, KBC is taking this position. Is that basically kind of what this is all summing up to be? This is a KBC takes this position. 100%. Okay. Because we've wrestled with the text. Yeah. We've wrestled with the corporate conscience. Where are the people in the church? And we're trying to discern what's the most loving way to apply what we see biblically in our church. And so this is our position. It's probably imperfect. Listen, man. I'm open to this being imperfect. And in 10 years, we have this conversation again. And I go, I'm an idiot. We did our best. You know what I mean? So I, you know, but this is our position moving forward based on our scriptural study, everything we've talked about. Um, this is the Kanawha Valley Church application of these texts. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Ashley Latham now has a question. <laughs> you, you, Just to be clear, you may go to 10 of our sister churches and 10 churches do this differently. Yeah. And this is not an area where we can judge. This is a, hey, it's different. I like it. I don't like it. I don't know. It depends on where I am. But this is not, again, this is not a core issue. This is just our application of these teachings. So, Ashley, do you have a question? Not a question. I just wanted to say thank you um, to you and the, the leadership team. I think having a position I know it can be hard depending on which side or not side, but like way of thinking that people are. But I will say um, we've been a part of a lot of churches that didn't have a position and it led to a lot of confusion and a lot of issues. And I think there was a scaredness or fear of making a decision. And I just want to say I really appreciate that because I think everyone knows what that position is. And of course, we can still talk about it and work through it but i just really appreciate having kind of a standard that we can even talk about so i just wanted to say thank you oh thank you that means a lot i appreciate that thank you to all the leadership group and the whole church wrestling with this and being patient as we did it this has been a long process so thank you to all so cool any others every single person I say to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Cody Lahan, it's your turn. <laughs> All right. Good. All right. So, what woman is doing communion? No, I'm just kidding. That's right. <laughs> anyway. So, all right. Great discussion. Th again, thank you to the church. Thank you to the leadership group for laboriously pouring over this and wrestling with it and discussing it. Thank you to the church for your patience and uh, encouragement as we've gone through this process. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that what we've, what we've landed on is God honoring and will be good for our church. Amen. 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 Awesome.